Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening. My name's Andrew Roberts. I'm one of the deans here at ANU. I'm dean of the College of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, and it's my great pleasure to be your host this evening. First, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. I don't know about you, but I love the ANU. I think it's a fantastic place. And I think I was asked to, to host this evening because my reaction uh, when the business of the redevelopment of Union Court was first uh, pitched at the, the senior management group was one of unbridled enthusiasm. I think this is probably one of the most exciting things I've seen in my time here at the ANU. It's a real wonderful reimagining of our campus, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. But of course, uh, as a university community, we consult, we talk to each other, we realize that we are not the repositories of all knowledge. Uh, we have to get feedback from the community, from students, from staff, from the broader community about how our campus looks. And so this uh, proceeding tonight is part of that process. Uh, a, a large number of people have been consulted over this. Something like 1,400, I understand, have, have actively engaged in the process around uh, the, the Union Court development. And I, I realize most of you here uh, are here tonight because you were engaged in that process and care very much about how this campus looks and feels and how we reinvent it for the future. So this showcase tonight is an opportunity to continue with that engagement. We'll have three speakers. Uh, to present to you how your input ha has led to, to uh, the, the proposals as they stand. For example, we will have a swimming pool um, as a result of, well, should I have said that? Yes. The plan is to have a swimming pool because the campus community wants a swimming pool. So that's one example of how you've been listened to. So really, it's, it's a chance to hear from, from the hierarchy and from the design team about how we've gone about this, and I'm lo looking very much forward to this. We'll have tonight's proceedings in, in two parts. The first part will be about 40 minutes uh, with three speakers uh, uh, giving the pitch, and then uh, I will compare a little later on the sofas uh, a conversation with you where you'll be able to ask questions of, of four key players in proceedings. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker. It's our Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic, Marnie Hughes-Warrington. Um, you've read the bio in the, in, the, in the booklet, so I won't say much, but I'm about to go off on study leave, and I'm going to go and write my first book. Um, I'm a scientist, so we write research papers rather than books, but Marnie has written six books, so those of us who are in that game are very impressed by that. They, they say that behind every deputy vice-chancellor is a property developer. Um, <laughs> actually, they say that about vice-chancellors and deans as well, but um, here's Marnie's chance to, to pitch to you the, the vision as it stands for now for, for the Union Court developments. Marnie. Thanks, Andrew. I want to welcome you to a world in which 28 million learners have connected to the Khan Academy. Welcome to a world in which last week edX welcomed its five millionth learner. Welcome to that world in ANU because 17 months ago we joined edX and in that time we've had 125,000 learners from every nation on earth learn with us. This university will be 70 years old next year and at that time we'll have graduated 100,000 students. 70 years, 100,000 students. 17 months, 125,000 students. Welcome to the world of digital disruption. This is an important world and we are part of it and not just a follower, but a leader in that world. The truth is I know this about ANU that we don't follow, we lead because you told us this. When we went out two years ago and we asked your advice, how do you want to learn, how do you want to teach, how do you want to research at ANU, the thing that you told us most was, this is a place of ambitious dreams. If you don't believe me, I want you to come back with me to 70 years ago. 70 years ago, we here would be standing in a paddock. Down that way is Canberra High. Down that way is old Canberra House. And in between, there is big dreams. I've seen the archives from that time. Roxanne fortunately showed me photo albums where a group of people sat around a table and said, let's create a university. 
and not only any university, but the best university in the world. And so they sat around the table and they created this university and then audaciously they put together photo albums because their job was to bring professors from all over the world to this big, empty field of dreams. Canberra High down there, old Canberra House down there, and nothing in between. It took an incredible act of audacity to reach out to the world, to actually seek the best in the world, and to bring them here. And the great thing about ANU was that those professors, that community, actually built this campus. This is our moment where we get to remember and pay respect to that dream. Because let's go forward and see how ambitious the dream has been since then, the Nobel Prizes. All of the research discoveries, and more recently, the ambition of our flexible double degrees, nearly 10 years of PhD enrolments, 240 journal articles by those students. This is a place which lives its motto, first to know the nature of things. If you're first to know the nature of things, you have to be ahead of where the world is. 28 million learners, 5 million learners, the world is changing rapidly. And I'm confident that we're not running behind it, we're running with it and we're going to run ahead of it. When we asked your advice about how we could do that, you came back with some very good sage advice to me. You said, that's great, Hughes Warrington, but the wireless doesn't work. <laughs> I love your idea that students could create MOOCs, but there isn't any place where we can do that without being rained on. I would love to dream and create a makerspace, an accelerator to get students to make things, to do things, but my classroom has no windows, no airflow, and one electricity outlet. Is there anybody here from AD Hope? <laughs> I feel really sorry for you. So here we were thinking, wow, we're a university built upon ambitious dreams. We came out of dry fields. We created all of these things, Nobel Prizes research, PHB, incredible approaches to research, to education, to public policy, and there's no wireless. There are no windows. There's 1,500 students who missed out on a bed, a residential place in our campus this year. And I'm not the only one, Roxanne, that when I get to a certain part of Chifley Library and I think, great, I can borrow a book, oh, it's in Menzies. <laughs> and I have to walk from one end of the campus to another. I'm a lazy borrower. I want them to come to me. The dream is big, but sometimes the reality makes it hard to catch the dream. You all told us we have big ambitions, we want those ambitions to be realised, but sometimes we feel like the physical environment does not reflect the pride that we have in this university. We want to be able to display our research achievements. We want to show people that a library is just as important now as it was before. One million visitors in 2014 to our libraries. One million. We want to be able to use classrooms where we can actually engage students in discussion. We want them to actually come along and participate and lead the learning and the teaching with us. In order to do those things, those ambitious dreams have to take flight in a reimagination of a core part of our campus. So it was fields. It became a car park, as you'll hear later. It then became Union Court. It does not match the ambition of this university, and we need to turn that around. So over two years, we've asked your views. Ambition, you said. The physical environment has to match the strategy. I have to be able to bring visitors here, and they have to know how great this place is. I need places where I can collaborate. I need places where I can teach appropriately. And yes, I need wireless. We'll talk about the swimming pool. But the truth is that many of you said these other elements are core to being a great university and it's time to remake that image. And we're not just making it for ourselves here and now or for the 100,000 people that have graduated. We're actually making it for the more than 125,000 people 
who've actually never visited this campus. Because this ANU is not just a Canberra ANU anymore, it's a global ANU. And I would like to be able to visit, invite all of those people to come to this place and say, of course ANU was the place that created that incredible approach to learning. So we need to do these things. We need to do it now. The last time that Union Court was renovated was 1972. Yeah, some of you did not exist <laughs> back then. I think it's about time, don't you? Some of us barely existed at that time. And it's showing its age. And while I respect those who tell me with great fervency that they heard Daddy Cool play there, that's marvellous, and they heard Midnight Oil play there, and they heard Nirvana play there, yeah, respect, total respect. <laughs> they heard those things. I would like a place where the next big world-changing music band comes here. It can't just be a track record of past dreams, it has to be a place of future dreams. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to outline to you how those dreams intersect with what you've told us and the design brief. It connects very closely with our work to refresh ANU by 2020, which will become ANU by 2025, and in particular the work we've been doing on the education plan ANU 2025. To give you a taster of that education plan, we're going to embark on new approaches to admissions, but we've also said the time is right to maximise our approaches to teaching that are focused on interaction between staff and students. Yes, we did put thermal sensors in the lecture theatres to track attendance, and surprise, surprise, we've discovered that seminars and tutorials are what people really want. We want to be able to create spaces where students, and not, only, not just staff, but students can make MOOCs, that we can have maker spaces that cross over between physical creation but digital creation as well. We wanted to be able to disseminate ideas, have public events in appropriate spaces, get our ideas out to the world, bring Canberra in, but importantly also bring more of our community home. 1,500 students missed out on a bed. We need to do something about that. Staff and PhD students struggle to get accommodation in this university because we don't have enough to offer. It's time to bring our community home and we hope tonight that you'll be able to see elements of us bringing the community back in the design brief. In terms of the instructions that we gave to the designers, I'm just going to display them. That's my second slide. We gave the team this brief and what we're going to hear tonight is their response to the brief and it's an opportunity for you after the discussion we'll have question and answer and then you'll be able to see some of the images outside and to engage further in consultation. Importantly, this is about capturing and making sure we've got your views right because we want to go to University Council confident that we've listened to you, that we've thought about this and that we're presenting the best possible case. It has not been approved, it's a dream. We're going to need your help to make sure that the dream gets realised. And with that, I'm now going to hand over to Phil, who's the project manager, who's going to walk us through realising the dream in the brief. Thank you, Phil. One of the things I reflected on to start with was uh, what, a, what a fantastic project to be involved in is this. Um, the opportunity to contribute to such a significant change in an organisation's culture doesn't come along very often, let me tell you, and it's, it's really a great honour. The um, um, project to date has really been, as Marnie said, about establishing those needs. And then once we've established those, um, how could we arrange them to deliver an amazing place? In a nutshell, that's our mission. Um, and underlying that uh, journey to date, and, and we'll continue to underlie, underlie whatever direction it takes in the future, is a, a very deep and an authentic engagement process with the university. I am a fundamental believer in engagement in, in my whole project work. That is uh, a tenant that we take with us and you can do no better research for whatever it is that you're trying to devise. So many of you have given to that, pro that process and will continue to and uh, it's, it's beyond your day job and uh, we really thank you for doing so. Andrew touched on just how many people have been involved in the engagement process to date. 
We have got something like 23,500 comments from you all. Obviously, that's a lot of material, but we've been able to distill it to some very distinctive threads that came up again and again. And, and, uh, and we're, we're quite remarkable, actually, in terms of that consistency, swimming pool being the number one. Uh, and uh, so we used some of our old customer focus there to convince uh, the executive that that really should have a business case developed for it and put it firmly on the, on the agenda. And, and that's the case at the moment. Let's hear, let's hear a little bit from some of uh, the community who have been a part of this, uh, and they're very articulate people, let me, t let me say. So let's see the video. Ah, Union Court. Uh, that's a tricky question. Uh... Where I'm from, we'd say that it lacks vibe. I would describe it as being fairly dated. Um, it's not a very exciting place. I would describe Union Court as a place that is a bit depressing. There's not much happening and it's just uninspiring. I think it's very grey. It's quite barren and it's probably a little bit too student oriented for me to want to spend much time there. It doesn't feel like a place that staff would necessarily hang out. Union Court is dull but still central and full of potential, at the same time irrelevant to a lot of people. What would I change about Union Court? What would I keep? Um, <laughs> when I walk through Union Court at the moment, everyone seems to be on a rush to lecture or back to their office or to get lunch. If I could see in the future a Union Court where people are sort of happy to sit and relax and, and stop and chat, that would be a lot better than it is currently. A place for people to come and sit and be and interact, run into people that you know, lecturers, academics, friends, staff. Make it a place where people actually want to be instead of coming in, doing what you need to do and getting out. What we're so lucky to have in Canberra is that we're half bush, half city. We don't have that in any other cities in Australia. So I think if Union Court could encapsulate that a bit better, that would be fantastic. If you could enjoy nature and lie on the grass and you know, kind of soak in the sun, or you can sit in a cafe, you know, a couple of steps away and get some work done and feel like you're in a city, then we'd have the best of both worlds. I'd like to have a place where I can come hang out with friends, have lunch, um, or if I'd like to, just have a bit of alone time and read a book. What I would change about Union Court is make it a place that has more options for students, more places to eat, um, more choices for coffee, um, better places to sit. I'd like to see some place that's a bit more interesting, a bit more colourful and dynamic. I live on campus and so for me, um, having a place that's open late at night and also on weekends is quite important. Somewhere to spend time that is on campus, that isn't somewhere away. You're not always trying to get off campus to see something exciting. So if we can improve Union Court to make it somewhere that we want to come between lectures or we want to come at lunchtime, then that's something that most universities don't have and that we need to really embrace at the ANU. I think a really great place is quite social and there's always great people watching. Definitely the atmosphere. It's got to be a place that makes you want to jump in and be a part of the action or just sit back and enjoy it. A great place should have interesting elements, sort of the element of surprise. You never know what's lurking around any corner. Places for performances and just places to hang out and have fun. There needs to be some character and a touch of quirkiness. Something interesting every direction that you look. If you can turn around, you, you see something that you mightn't have seen before. All of your senses are engaged. It's somewhere that's open late at night. Unfortunately for the rest of society, students are nocturnal beings and we need something that excites us when everyone else is going to bed. One of the great places that I can think of at the moment, there's a park in the middle of town that has bars surrounding it. But in the middle, there's kids running around and there's people sunbaking. That's what would make a really great place. Somewhere you can sit, get some work done, meet people. Everyone's happy. It's a great place to, to chill out and hang around and not feel lonely. Somewhere where there's always something going on, be it day and night, all through the week and throughout the year, where you feel comfortable to go with your family and your friends, or meet new people even. Variety. It's all the places you can eat, especially as a student, you want places that you can eat that are great but cheap as well. And coffee, coffee. You've got to have great coffee and you've got to have lots of choices for it. I think it's important to create a great place at Union Court to give the university a real heart and to make it an inspiring place and also somewhere that makes me want to do my best work for the university. 
It's so important that we create a great place here at the ANU that showcases what we can produce at the university. Visitors at the moment who come from Canberra or from elsewhere in Australia or from across the world don't see in Union Court just how good we are at the ANU and just what we can produce. Every university needs a heart. Every university needs a place where students can come and relax after their classes, between classes, and just making sure that the university isn't a place where you come and go between your lectures, but somewhere that you want to come and enjoy it because you enjoy being here. Well, I think uh, that in itself is almost a brief, that little video, and if you wrapped it around the needs, um, you, you indeed do have one. But let's just talk a little bit about some of the themes that did come from your, your work. There obviously is a missing ingredient which is called urbanity. Um, there is a marvellous garden campus, uh, but we've just heard just how much of the urbanity which is sought generally is missing. Um, owning the evenings uh, was seen as, as one of the big themes uh, that, that really was missing, that as soon as the sun goes down, um, it really is not a very inviting place, it's unsafe, uh, and, and that needs to be fixed. And the third one was that really understand the ingredients of music, food and ideas and how they can come together in the creation of a great place and how that in itself can become a major bridge to the Canberra community to actually break down some of the, the uh, uh, perceptions of, uh, and realities of uh, an elite and uh, aloof community that that the ANU actually is seen as by the, the uh, Canberra community, mostly because there's really nothing here that, that attracts them, really. There were about five real strong themes that came through this work that just, out of those 23,000 items, just resonated so strongly, and you'll see some excellent boards out there in the foyer which talk to this stuff. And so uh, the first of those was that, can you make it authentic? Can you actually make it a place that really says something about ANU and its Canberra setting and the origins of this university. You can take ideas from around the world, uh, you, can, uh, you can sample great places, but interpret it in the idiom that is Canberra. Whilst the primary feature and, and objective here is to create excellent and great and outstanding places of learning and research, you need to be able to inter intersperse the sociability and the playfulness so that these things can come together to create a great place. Green and urban can coexist. In the work that you're interpreting, you need to actually bring these together. The great garden campus needs to infuse itself into the, the Union Court. The sense of relaxation and conviviality and vitality needs to be interspersed as well. These things might seem like they're mutually exclusive, but uh, I, I, we don't think they are, and you've told us that you want it that way, and uh, I think we, we've, we've got some exciting propositions around that. This whole idea which Marnie talked about of um, all of the things uh, that are so fantastic about the ANU and what it has achieved, they're tucked away in little showcases in the various colleges, or they're actually hidden in the archives uh, of, of the libraries. Uh, and, and there is an intense desire to bring that forward and put it on display in a very powerful way so that not only is your pride in this university actually demonstrated, but the community actually sees just what is achieved here. This is a very, very powerful component, I believe, of the whole brief. So um, out of all of that, we wrote a pretty comprehensive development brief um, and uh, you, you'll see some of the aspects of that when you look at the boards outside around um, the, the, the depiction of what this could look and feel like using powerful imagery so that when the urban designers were selected and, and got on board, they actually started from a place um, which had a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding about what were the expectations of your community. And uh, that brings me to Joe Haruda, who I'm uh, now going to hand over to. Joe is an urban designer uh, from Vancouver. He founded a firm called Civitas Urban Design and Planning a long time ago. Uh, he's had many, many years of experience around the world. He's a new urbanist uh, by ph philosophical stance um, and I think that's just perfect for this project because this is about passion to connect people and places and um, I, I, I have to say that over probably 10 years now, Joe has taught me a lot about the difference between urban design and architecture. 
they are fundamentally different uh, interpretations of place. And this is about urban design. Architecture will follow. So, Joe. Uh, thank you, Phil. I'd like to uh, say in starting to the audience that it really is a genuine honor to be selected to be part of this great collaborative team that we've been working with for the last four months. They're all sitting here in the front row. And uh, it's been a real pleasure working with this team. We couldn't have done it without them. The boldness of this initiative for re-envisioning University Avenue will forever change the experience of this campus and reinforce the stature of the university as one of the great universities of the world. Phil, you asked me uh, uh, how we started to approach this, uh, this task of re-envisioning the campus. So we started by looking uh, at the context of the village study area within the surrounding campus in the city looking at what some of the forces are outside of the campus that could influence this also in the future. And also understanding the, the uh, Burley Griffin plan with its original vision for University Avenue. We noted that the avenue has, had always been intended by Griffin as a place of greater density, height, and urban activity. He talked about the great boulevards and how they would become active places in the city. And he also identified that uh, there would be a major public building in the location of today's Union Court at the heart of that campus core. At the eastern end, eastern and western ends of the, uh, of the avenue in CSIRO and Civic are concentrations of employment and living which will continue to intensify. These growth centers will continue con to contribute to the activation of University Avenue as an urban place over time. We then established uh, the team through a, uh, a workshop process with a, the, the team, a set of aspirational principles. So the first of these was the central theme of a new approach to learning and innovation characterized by a place uh, that is compact and urban, engaging and eclectic, activated and always alive, and innovative and inter enterprising. We also want need to create a knowledge-based village around a series of amazing people places or third places informed by the kinds of experience people have said are missing from the campus today. We need to focus on achieving a more compact, urban, walkable experience on campus with human scale, focusing on public safety, with students and staff living in the heart of the village. We all know what University Avenue feels like walking down at, uh, at this time of night. And how are we going to change that feeling? Integrating with nature, uh, pardon me, with, uh, with learning, where places of serenity and calm create balance, and engaging landscape architecture in new ways, such as new green roof on the library. Developing a mobility framework that provides greater accessibility in, into this precinct through the introduction of a new loop road, and a small-scale grid of streets and laneways that provide multiple options for moving through the precinct. And lastly, creating a destination by arranging all of the village uses in a memorable and evocative way that appeals to the campus and the larger community and adding new elements such as an outdoor amphitheater and a sig significant tower marker. The urban design interpretation of these principles resulted in this assemblage of buildings, open spaces, and, and this new street grid. Extending from the gateway at Childers Street on the left to University in this Avenue in the center and culminating in Union Court on the right at a new Union Tower and Sullivan's Amphitheater on the creek. We be began this process by thinking about organizing the brief around a series of campus rooms, each distinct in character and purpose, integrated via a central green spine of University Avenue. These rooms uh, were best characterized as the campus gateway, the living village, the village heart and the green eco-spine along Sullivan's Creek. The most significant or signature elements of this brief were placed at the entry point and surrounding Union Court at its entry portal. A new library location to the north of University Avenue that could accommodate the significant scale and strategic importance of the library was chosen as the primary and iconic social and learning focus. This location capitalizes on its high visibility and presence on the square along, and along Sullivan's Creek and Sullivan's Garden to the north, inviting these places to enrich the interlibrary experience. Its great hall and veranda roof 
that you see here projecting over into uh, Union Court invites the Union Court into the heart of the library as an indoor meeting and exhibition space. A new library lane that provides an ideal location to integrate the ANU Film Club, Bar and Event Spaces so that they engage the library Great Hall and spill onto Sullivan's lawn north of the library. As you all know, that's currently a lot of uh, car parking, uh, a car parking lot, and it's uh, it's something that really needs to be uh, placed in the context of the new, new library being its front yard. The decision to focus the signature functions of student life, teaching, and learning spaces, innovation, and health and well-being was driven by a need to concentrate the energy and flow in and out of these buildings and between these buildings across Union Court as a kind of crossroads where the ebb and flow during the day and evening provide an intense level of human interaction. The temporal rhythm of each of these functions is, is really quite different. Uh, the health gym and pool areas, uh, for example, generate peak movement early in the mornings, around noon and in the evening while the learning and teaching facilities with their scheduled activities create a constant peak and ebb cycle over the hourly periods during the day. The Student Life Center has a constant pedestrian rhythm throughout the day, to and from each of the other places around the square. Its location is a key portal to the square at the crossroads of a new North Street and the East West Avenue recognize that students will be coming to it from all directions. In essence, this was all about capturing and engaging the human energy and life in such a way that it creates planned and unexpected face-to-face -face interactions. We refer to this often as the bump factor, a metric for determining the success of a space for stimulating conversation. This court grouping also provides a significant vertical scale that creates a sense of urbanity and spatial containment for Union Court. As you all know, if you, when you stand in that space today, surrounded by one and two story buildings, it has no sense of a place. Where is this place and what is it that defines the, its edges? The Great Hall and Green Lawn, New Green Lawn, together with cafes and restaurants animating its, its edges, helps capture people and encourage them to stay longer in the precinct as a kind of social glue or stickiness of the Union Court. The Chancellery location was influenced by the opportunity presented to adaptively reuse Chifley itself, transforming the space into a contemporary working environment, surrounded by the meadow, the creek, and the oval, with a new ceremonial front door directly onto Union Court. Incidentally, that, foot, that Chifley footprint precisely meets the requirement for the, for the Chancellery's uh, future needs which is a, con uh, a very con convenient uh, coincidence. Thinking about where the residential should be located, the residential addresses, their location was influenced by the opportunity that University Avenue Promenade Green Tree Canopy presented for creating a sense of a new neighborhood focus, a real living neighborhood around an amazing space, ensuring that the buildings framing that street have a human scale and create pedestrian interest and safety. The adjacency of this neighborhood to Union Court further supports the viability for a grocery store, uh, just in the location uh, number four where the, where the University uh, Student Center is located, and increases the customer base for other shops and cafes on the square, adding another element to evening activation. So effectively, we try to arrange the needs of the university in a memorable way that creates an authentic place and reforces its images as uh, one of the great new places uh, in the world. So Joe, um, that, that's a, an arrangement of buildings and arrangement of needs. So mm -hmm. I think the thing that we would love to hear about is what, what is that experience? How would you describe that experience? That is the most critical question of all, Phil. It's this, the human experience, how you're going to experience the space as walking between these buildings. As you said earlier, urban design is really about thinking about the space we're creating between buildings, what they feel like, what is their scale, what activates them, what makes them interesting places that we would want to come back time and again. So we need to think about this as an imagining journey along the avenue. So I'd like to take you on a walk through from, from the gateway through to, uh, to Sullivan's Creek and talk about the, the, this necklace of experiences and places that you would encounter in those spaces between buildings. The architectural images, by the way, that you're going to see in, uh, in these examples 
are really not relevant to, uh, to how we see these spaces. What's important is the, uh, the sense of this, how they define these new places. From the beginning, the university has articulated its uh, desire to create a great place at the heart of the campus. A place that is very human in scale with a strong and vibrant public realm Excellent. that captures the imagination of the campus community. So starting at the gateway, let, let's imagine a gateway that creates a new arrival experience on Childers at the intersection of Childers and University Avenue. Using public art, significant lighting elements, landscape treatments, and an activated street theater edge to strengthen the nexus between the campus and the city. It clearly would establish the, a vibrant and innovative personality of ANU and welcome the community into the university precinct. Emerging from the new gateway, imagine a new green living village space with residential addresses, teaching, learning, and innovation spaces, a diversity of cultural spaces, pop-up art galleries, small great coffee houses, a bookstore, and small cafes. University Avenue imagined as an important connection between Civic and Sullivan's Creek, an important movement corridor, and a shared way for pedestrians, bicycles, and, believe it or not, cars. Buildings will be human in scale, designed with a uh, pedestrian promenade and colonnade to protect pedestrians from the weather, and imagine front doors to the townhouses and apartments with balconies overlooking the street and celebrating light at night for safety. Imagine lawn courts alongside pop-up pavilions hosting campus and community events. The Wednesday markets, Art Not a Park Festival. Book launches and student exhibits could all find a home in this great new space. Imagine the secret garden together with the reinvigorated tank provides an intimate landscape of learning and social spaces. Imagine this as a place for outdoor games, evening classes around fire pits, and a quiet place for lunch and conversation. Always sunny and protected from winter winds. It was one of the most remarkable spaces that I found on campus that I thought we really needed to kind of respect and reinforce as an experience because of the sense of calmness and strong place that it, that it provides. Now, arriving in Union Court, you'll find the most highly activated part of the campus, a new destination for both the campus and Canberra community to enjoy. Imagine this as an amazing living room for the campus, a place to meet and to linger, a crossroads from all directions, and a fitting location for the most iconic library and learning commons. Imagine a grove of trees, an amazing new lawn, and sitting edges that will become the new space for socializing with friends and sharing ideas. Sun on the lawn, dappled light under the trees. And imagine at the lawn level, cafes and shops spilling out onto the edges of the court, providing animation and vibrancy well into the evening. And perhaps on weekends, converting the, the lawn into a, a weekend market space. This will become one of the most used and photographed spaces at the heart of the campus. This progression from lawn to pond to the softer landscape of Sullivan's Creek. And to the right, you will see the new iconic library with its great hall and veranda. The digital learning commons with its fully automated document retrieval system will become a key focus of this shared intellectual life bringing no new knowledge and ideas to the heart of the campus. Looking upward, imagine a rooftop green garden space on top of the library, a place for outdoor study or simply calm respite and contemplation. Imagine a laneway cutting through the library, a lane that flows from the square into a natural and lawned edges of Sullivan's Creek to the north. Imagine new home of the ANU Film Club and major events and performance space along that lane where music and entertainment can spill out onto the lane and onto Sullivan's Green on the north edge of the library. Chifley Lane is another intense pedestrian experience connecting from the new loop road, passing the Health and Wellbeing Center with its gym and a proposed swimming pool, and leading onto a new river walk along the edge of a Sullivan's Pond created at the juncture with a bridge. Imagine a laneway for small casual cafes, a bike shop, the underground jazz club, and essential services including a grocer. And across the creek, imagine a new ANU tower would provide an elevated vantage point for viewing the campus, revealing the lake and the capital city's most important buildings in the distance, and a visual marker uh, for the entire campus as a legibility device to help you find your way to this important place. 
In the final part of our walk, we would arrive at the nexus between the square and Sullivan's Creek. Beside the bridge, imagine an amphitheater. Imagine this amphitheater, a significant new performance space for outdoor cinema, bands, student performances. And as, during the day is a great place to hang out and feel the warmth of the sun and the cooling effect of the water in this wonderful wild landscape of Sullivan's Creek. And imagine on a summer's night, 300 people gathered on the edge of Sullivan's Creek for a performance. So in conclusion, this journey uh, through the gateway to the campus heart at Union Court from Sullivan's Creek to the library and Great Hall, through the laneway surrounding Chifley and back into University Avenue, will provide a rich and varied set of places for rituals and memory-making experiences, not only meeting the future needs of the university, but creating an amazing place as well. So now we'll open up to, to questions from the audience. Uh, we have two people with roving mics, I understand, at either end. And if you have questions, please put your hands up and we will find a way to get a mic to you. There's one here and there's one here to start with. So we'll start over here first. I'm Ping, I'm a professional staff. Um, thank you very much for sharing such an um, exciting and very ambitious plan uh, to re redevelop the uh, Union Court. Um, I have worked here for just over 10 years, so I would like to hang around and see this project completed. Um, so. Thank you very much. My question is about uh, sustainability. Uh, it's very important to all of us, and just wanting to ask um, all of you what is your approach towards sustainability? So, um, well, probably uh, I, I answer okay. that one for now. Um, the part of our team um, is a very powerful concept called the, uh, the One Planet Framework. And uh, Caroline Nola, who was going to be here today, but she's sick, uh, runs a little company called The Footprint Company. And uh, she, uh, she got her PhD in the uh, how to quantify effectively uh, the consumption of the Earth's resources when it comes to the built environment. And so we're in the process of delineating a target around um, how many planets that this project would use. Um, Pretty much we think one planet is uh, easily achievable and at the workshop, the last workshop we had, we set ourselves the target of achieving half a planet. And so what that means is that this project would effectively use half a planet of the world's uh, productive resources to actually affect this project. That's a very ambitious goal, but some universities are now uh, on a building by building basis uh, attempting to do that. So there is a very deep and genuine sustainability program that's attached to this project. Can you explain to us what a half a planet rating yeah. is? <laughs> uh, I'm Caroline, sitting here being scandalised. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, the, the concept of eco footprint is about how much of, uh, how many global hectares you're using of the Earth's productive resources to actually to build uh, a square metre of, of built form. And so, you know, typically at the moment, I think the world's chugging along at about two. Uh, and of course, in the, in the developed uh, economies, it's chugging along at about two and a half. And Australia is right up there, let me tell you. So, um, you know, it's a way of looking at the whole of life consumption and operational consumption uh, as a consequence of what you build. And so it's a very effective tool to actually measure whole of life consumption. As opposed to some of the, some of the uh, systems that have been used around Green Star, which essentially measure uh, your design effort. And they don't necessarily take into account uh, the effective use of capital to achieve the result. So the One, the one Planet uh, footprint, and we will organise more uh, effective dissertations on this with Caroline, but uh, the One Planet foot lot footprint enables us to effectively look at, at where the capital goes to get the result, and you, you, you get effective capital investment decisions out of that as well. Andrew, can I talk about social sustainability as well? Yeah. Can, can I just ask yeah. first? Mm. So what I take you to mean from that is mm. that for the whole of life operation yeah. of, of what we're talking about, mm. you're effectively using half of... You're using one-fifth of the, the, the type of resources that are typically used mm. In, in modern development? Is uh, it, 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 a shopping centre is chugging along at about two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, typically, at the moment, campuses across the world are at about 1.3. Mm -hmm. Some of them are better. Um, UC Davis is one of the exemplars that we're looking at. So, yeah, this, the, it, it's, it depends on the intensity okay. of, the, of the form, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Marnie. I was just going to say, the other side to this is social sustainability. Yeah. So one of the most common pieces of feedback that we've received over two years and that I get is that students and staff tell me that they're actually lonely. Um, we also combine that with a counselling service and medical service that's, that's overwhelmed by um, people wanting to use its services. So we've put a very big focus on creating a space, putting the, the accommoda student accommodation in there and staff accommodation there to generate activity in the space so that people feel like there's a place they can go and be with other people creating smaller cafes where people can actually sit down and talk to one another, and then, of course, improving our wellbeing provision for both staff and students. We said that's really critical, just as critical mm. as the environmental story, mm. because we want to make sure that this is, this is a great mm. environmental place, but also a great place to work and to live mm. for many, many staff and students. I, I think, you know, I, I still like the simplistic, relatively simplistic approach of the triple bottom line, which talks yeah. about social outcomes, it talks about environmental outcomes and it talks about economic outcomes and I know there have been a million theories evolved since then but you know what, if you're really striving to get that intersection between those, I think you're really going to get a good product. Great. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I should have introduced the fourth member of our panel who is Christine Allard who is the director of the ANU's Facilities and Services Division <coughs> um, who is clearly a very key part of any developments on campus so she will be answering some of our questions. Thanks. We've got a question over here. Jamie Pittock, an academic staff member for only eight years. Uh, I think the, the university should be congratulated, the administration, for thinking of such a visionary redevelopment, and I thoroughly support that. And I think that the, uh, the concepts we've seen here are very excited. What I don't see in the university's brief to the consultants is anything about transport. Now, Joe touched on walkability, touched on a new loop road, which sounds like a great idea to me, but as a cyclist, I think this university is utterly awful. And University Court is a place of conflict between pedestrians and cyclists. The university mouths in its plans the ideal of having uh, fewer cars coming to campuses but keeps building car parks in the middle of campuses to suck them in. <laughs> if you get a bus to Barry Drive, you have to slog through the undergrowth on a muddy track to actually get to your workplace. So I guess my question is, will this sustainability vision be matched by sustainable yeah. access to get here? Well, uh, yes is the answer. Um, a, a big component of the sustainability drive um, and, and also the convenience factor is a, a big focus on cycling. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with uh, Christine's group to understand how many people now come on bikes, um, how many more could, uh, what sort of cyclists are they, um, do they require end of trip facilities of a certain type, where should they be placed effectively. Uh, and uh, in, in addition to that, the loop road gives us the opportunity to really build on the municipal transit system. Uh, we're talking to the ACT government and, you know, if the, um, the light rail uh, does go ahead, we would love to see a station, a node, very close, really ideally at the end of uh, London Circuit and University Avenue, and, and a very effective reprogramming of the bus. Yes situation there. Yeah, so it's very much part of the, of the proposition. I'd, I'd love to reinforce that point uh, about the use of bicycles as well and the importance of transit. I was really impressed by the university's aspiration to increase bike usage to, in the future to 20% of all the trips to the campus. I think they're less than 5% today. Uh, so the, the, the campus really does lack any infrastructure to make bikes convenient and safe as a way to get around. And when you look at, as you well know, the scale of this campus is, is amazing. Its, its length from <coughs> north to south is equivalent to the entire Sydney CBD, from Circular Quay down to uh, uh, Central, Central Station, right, yeah, Central very right. close to Central Station. So bikes will enable you to do that in, in minutes. However, the, the, the issue that arises is the one you mentioned of pedestrian conflict. And how you design that infrastructure 
to deal with that conflict is at the heart of how to, how to do it really well, to just create a really dedicated system for cyclists that doesn't conflict with pedestrian movement. And I, I recently visited uh, UCSB in, in uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, which has been able to get its bike usage up to 50%. And when you walk around that campus, the bikes are so visible constantly. They have, uh, I, I, uh, I don't want to refer to them as bike freeways, but they're pretty darn close. They really move at a, at a good clip, and you'll actually see bike roundabouts on the campus as a way of sorting out movements in different directions. So getting that right is critical. Right in our planning for this particular tiny piece of the campus, we've made accommodation for, for, for demonstrating how and where these end-of-trip facilities, which are really part of that, really important part of that infrastructure. You know, what happens when you get there and where do you park your bicycle and how do you protect it from the rain and and how all that works is, uh, has been considered uh, in, in, the, in the detail conceptual planning for, uh, for uh, this, this core. Great, thanks. We have a question up here. I'm Igor Skrebin, I'm from Energy Change Institute. I want my next question, and go straight to the question, is again about sustainability, part from the point of view of energy sustainability. We are talking about new development and modern view on sustainability is for university or for part of university to generate its own energy. And that's very important, specifically considering that we are part of ACT with ambitious but realistic target to have 90% of our energy from renewable energy resources. Mm. So I'm wondering how this opportunity is, okay. uh, will integrate in itself uh, energy option. Phil. Uh, well, again, in conjunction with uh, Christine's group, uh, we're about to embark on an overarching energy strategy study for the campus. Um, we started off thinking about these very things for the project itself, but it very quickly becomes uh, a question of scale and, and what's right. Uh, and so, again, that study will look at how to use capital effectively to actually get the result that we're after. And, uh, you know, the way that the ACT government is trending their trajectory puts that very much on the path of perhaps you buy the energy straight from them and you, you avoid the complications of industrial plant, a significant industrial plant, and you, and you let them do that. And so, yeah, we're, uh, we're about to embark on that study. And in fact, um, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at the big pathways, the big pieces where you might actually get to half a planet, that energy source is obviously massive in how you do that. Okay, we have a question over here, then one down the front. Um, so, hi, my name is Edith Peters. I started off as an undergraduate and are now part of the professional staff. I was wondering what opportunities have you included for citizen scientists and lifelong learning on campus in Union Court and the surrounds? That's Morning. my question, that's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, absolutely. Um, my assumption is that the, the, the learning starts with actually our ANU Extension program, which we have over now 300 high school students who are studying with ANU, um, doing so twice or three times a week, providing them a space where they can do learning through to undergraduate spaces for, for maker spaces, more residential accommodation for PhD students, but also we have a very active continuing education program in two forms. The first is edX itself, which has got a, a large digital life, but we've noticed that wherever we run our MOOCs, a lot of people want to get together in particular places to discuss the ideas, even when there's 15,000 people enrolled. And the second wing of that is actually the Centre for Community um, Continuing Education. So we went out this year and we did market research on the demand for continuing education. And ANU, in fact, has one of the very few continuing edu education programs still going in an Australian university. A lot of the others have closed down. When we went out, we found significant interest and demand. And uh, you'll be unsurprised to learn. Um, a lot of people were wanting to study history with us. They want to study the visual arts. They want to study music. But there's also a desire for upskilling and change. And the two themes that were coming out to us were li living in a more digital world, learning digital skills, 
but being part of the change and the transformation that sees the sciences as a critical part to understanding our society. So we're seeing really good feedback from uh, students age 15 right through to up into their 90s saying that they want to learn with us, not just online, but they want to learn in spaces where they can talk to one another, participate, make things, cre create. And so all of that, and then additionally, the students have told me that they would really like to make MOOCs as well. So we thought we will provide a space, a MOOC maker mm. space for students and also a, probably a DJ mashup studio. I'm told it's not a radio station. <laughs> Students actually create music. I think this is a terrific, a terrific thing. So it's about um, making visual objects, sound objects, sciences, languages, history, the whole bit. Um, there's huge demand for that in Canberra, which absolutely delights me. So yes, even if we're the only continuing education program left in Australia, we are going to be absolutely sensational, not just by being the only one, but by, a, by being a great one. Great, thanks Marnie. We have a question down the front. Uh, David Williams, um, I'm with the Humanities Research Centre and formerly Director of the School of Art. Uh, one of the great virtues of the ANU campus is the wonderful sculpture program mm. and the visual art mm. program, Drill Hall Gallery, School of Art Gallery and so on. My question is, um, in this grand idea, which is wonderful, uh, what scope is there for site-specific commissioned sculpture that could be integrated yeah. into the uh, great development? Question. Yeah, we. we we went through the cost plan this week and there is a significant amount of money in there for that very program. So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, one, one of Joe's colleagues uh, who's part of the urban design team uh, from Oculus, um, they'll be uh, developing that ground plan and that public realm and those strategies and there will definitely be in a continuation and extension of the fantastic public art. But, but varieties of art, David, so sculptural yeah. definitely. We also wanted to create more pop-up spaces for temporary yes. exhibitions as yes. well. Um, and importantly, the Oculus team, some of you will know them, they're the creators of New Acton. So there's been a really deliberate work to integrate art into the space and make it a vital part of the experience. So, yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah. 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 No. There's, there's two, there's... Yeah, several layers of that. And one of the things that we will get to if this proceeds is, is in the uh, design development phase to, to have a very rich contextual interpretation that, that we would be looking to very high quality interpretations of that material in, yeah. in the built form as well. Um, yeah. It's already started, David. I believe there's actually some examples you'll see this evening where we actually asked some students from the School of Art to begin to think about Mm. visualising the space, so there's actually some examples out there where they've helped us to think about, sure. yeah, yeah, mm. think about a new way, which is terrific, yeah. Oh, well, some <laughs> of those spaces, you know, that, the thing about those lanes and the 50 to 80 metre blocks, mm. the, every corner, every change of grade is a little opportunity for another piece of creativity, and, and we see those schools being absolutely important in actually how those yeah. things come <coughs> to life. Uh, we, um, just to again reinforce that point, uh, we saw the uh, entry gateway. It's a very difficult, as, as an opportunity for art, uh, we, it's a really difficult space to deal with. We don't control the law court building, we don't control the street theater, but we can use, we thought we, you can really use uh, uh, art. We talked about glass art boxes as being one of the elements of that space, creating a sequence of either sculpture or art. And continuing that theme, uh, one of the things we've talked about is continuing that theme all the way along the avenue. Mm. That could be part of an experience of a sculpture walk or an art walk. That it, it's one of the, this, the, the um, things that could really you know, express the importance of art and music in the campus. And music, music is as important. Uh, when I looked at the plan of the music school and saw the jazz of the, the jazz practice room, I thought, "Well, what would I ever love to hear hear the jazz? That jazz class down in Piffley Lane, with their own little nightclub playing jazz every night, in, in, instead of being in that room down there. Uh, let them set up a business and and operate a jazz club. I mean, music and art, uh, and they're right at the front door of the campus." We can, connecting art and music into that University mm -hmm. Avenue as, as a broad idea, I think, is some real power uh, that could influence this plan at another level. Great. We have a question at the front from Sarah, then one up here, and then there's two more 
in the middle for which we'll need microphones. Sarah. So I'm Sarah Pearson, the CEO of the Canberra Innovation Network. I want to say congratulations. It looks like a fantastic plan. And the thing that I get really excited about is it looks like a place for what I think of as collisions. So plenty of collisions between the arts, the sciences, between where you live, where you work, where you learn. And uh, I'm particularly excited to see the innovation building quite at the centre of that. So um, I have a question about that, though. As you walk down the avenue, you see some of those pictures. I can get a feel for all the collision places in the space in the centre. But uh, my question is, how have you got ideas about how to make sure that people don't just scurry off into their buildings and shut the door and, and don't see it? I particularly feel really strongly about the innovation building. It's a, it's a culture change that needs to happen at ANU. So how do you get what's inside that building to help change the culture to make it more innovative across the whole ecosystem? And the second question is, if I think about Kendall Square at um, MIT, <coughs> it's attracting, you know, there's, there's a, an innovation square there, loads of entrepreneurs and startups, which is attracting large companies to come and, and live there and, and have their offices there. Mm -hmm. Is there room for expansion? <coughs> you know, my, my vision is that in 20, 30 years' time, there's a lot of multinationals who actually want to come and live here too. So mm. is there going to be that expansion opportunity? So there's a question here about collisions, which I guess... Joe's That's best. Joe's job. Joe's job. <laughs> and the innovation one, perhaps Marnie. Mm -hmm. mm. Joe. Uh, the other person who's really <laughs> passionate about this innovative part, I don't see him here. Yeah. He's disappeared. Well, Sam, but he Sam could where speak are you? Very eloquently <laughs> to that. Yeah. He, he's the man who would love to talk to this. And uh, uh, yeah, he, he really influenced our thinking on how that could play out and where it should play out in, in the plan. And we didn't really talk about that. Uh, about where that might be located, and, and we saw that as, a, as having a very significant presence on the avenue, at, the, at that nexus between the avenue and the, and the plaza, at the Innovation Center, and its visibility and accessibility was really important, to, uh, important message to really engage those, those elements and make them part of, uh, a very visible part of the experience. And the example you gave was there. There's some really wonderful examples how, of how that can play out uh, in these new spaces that, that we're creating. And so we really need to develop that, uh, that thinking with uh, people like Sam, Sam's passion to help, help you know, give materiality to, the, to that thinking. I could say, Sarah, one of the things you'll notice is what, what is it located next to? You'll see that it's right next to learning and teaching spaces. So one of the challenges we put to the team was, could you confuse us about whether we're in an accelerator or in a classroom? We wanted to, some of that to bleed out into, because when we visited accelerators, they're often furnished in ways that look like classrooms. So we wanted to deliberately blur the boundary between those two and place them next to one another to, to really reinforce the notion of an innovation ec ecosystem that's actually taking in undergraduates as well as um, the Canberra community. So we wanted to make a gesture there, a very powerful one. We also wanted to have maker spaces in there as well. Then on the other side of it, we've put it right next to the public events space. Um, now, I've got a lot of feedback from the colleges saying that they're often renting venues off campus where they can actually have meetings with industry and talk to people outside of ANU and they aren't doing that on the ANU campus a lot of the time because the spaces aren't right. So we've scoped it and we've placed it, ANUE right in the middle of the teaching but also that outreach activity so that people will be able to have meetings, go into ANUE, but then they can see the teaching that's going on in the space as well. Because you're right, putting it there is a great challenge to the university to say we are fundamentally an innovative organisation but sometimes our innovation travels down one path and it could travel down multiple paths. And so we've been, I think, a bit provocative putting it there and I absolutely stand by it. I think it's the right thing for this university to do to encourage that, that shift. Great. So we have a question at the back with a microphone. I've, oh, I've yeah. got a microphone here. Um, Brett Yates, I graduated in 1971. Mm. Um, but I regularly come back to the ANU, partly because I'm the, on the committee of the ANU Film Group. But I, I come to talks at the Centre for European Studies. Uh, last year you had a number of diplomats that were talking there. And you get a good audience of non-student, non-academics of that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm exploring how important is it to get people from the Canberra community here. So you're, you're succeeding with people there. Um, I went to a um, conversation and book launch with Ross Giddens recently. 
that was in the economics area. You, you do a lot of book launches with the Canberra Times and some of those are absolutely packed. Mm -hmm. So you're succeeding in getting a lot of people in here. The film group, for example, gets 300 people and more to some of the screenings. But they're all disparate sort of things. So people come in to do that and then they go. So I might meet somebody and, and say, oh, look, let's talk about this. And we end up going to Braddon or Dixon. So I can see exactly what the need is for what you're doing Absolutely. here. Mm -hmm. So if, if people meet and they can just go somewhere really close and, and, and have those sort of facilities where they can talk and meet and discuss and all that sort of thing. So is that the sort of, do you, do you want a lot of non-ANU people coming Absolutely. in? Mm -hmm. And how, is that what we're trying to do, is to keep them here yeah. for more? Um, we keep talking about the 500 to 1,000 people that are on the campus any particular night of the week that are attending events and yet, you know, basically they do nothing for that heart of the campus. So there is a major component of this is about aggregation uh, and then triangulation is what I call it, which is uh, having attended a primary event, what are the other things that are necessary to make that experience holistic? That's the cafes, mm -hmm. perhaps the, the music, the bar. Um, Etc. So there is a big piece of that plan that is about aggregation of facilities and bringing the film club right into the heart, um, multi multi uh, use facilities that can be used for those sorts of events, and then actually programming the the cafes and the food so that they support that and each supports the other. And w one of the primary goals here is to actually really effectively engage with the with the Canberra community and how do you do that? You have to actually program this stuff so that it's actually relevant to them and they see it as another place, another third place that they can go. And we keep talking about Braddon and how the corporate architects up there are doing us a favour because you know every, every cute little thing they knock down up there and they stick another corporate building on it gives us the opportunity to create this in a genuine way that actually yeah. becomes uh, another one of the villages around Canberra. And extending the life of the campus, so this part of the campus beyond the 40-odd week academic calendar uh, is, is the secret yeah. to doing that. And uh, I'd like just, just to make a comment about, uh, uh, we, we were really fascinated by looking at how Griffin had imagined the university and its relationship to the city, that the University Avenue was actually the city coming into the campus as a living place. People would live there, and that was the edge of campus. It, and somehow, over time, the campus has, it's the opposite. has spread across yeah. and, and engulfed that avenue and taken away the mm. part of the city. And, mm. and you know, the thought that people can now live there, they're, they're going to be university staff, mm and students, but it's going to be a real living place, and those are the people of the city, and uh, we, really, uh, we really need to welcome in the community because it was intended as part of the community uh, that at the University Avenue was really, really was the village heart. The, the library was intended to sit on the avenue, and uh, so that integration of community and campus is, I think, a vital part of the thinking of I this mean, plan. I mean, when things finish tonight, where are you going to go for dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> the number of times I've been to evening functions on campus with my wife and right, let's walk to Civic or mm. Childers Street. Right. Wouldn't it be great to have something here? Mm. Uh, we had a question just here. Hello. Um, my name's Michael. I'm an undergraduate student at the ANU. Uh, Could you speak up a bit, please? I'm Michael. I'm an undergraduate student at the ANU. This redevelopment presents a lot of opportunities for some very integral organisations on campus, some of which are currently located in Union Court, to have dedicated custom designed spaces, specifically uh, the learning communities, the departments, especially disabilities, the XSA and the Anusa's Brian Kenyon student space. I'm wondering if you've consulted any of these organisations and to what extent you plan to consult these organisations in the future and whether you're planning to provide dedicated spaces. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Absolutely. So, um, Anusa and Paso, in fact, you will, probably will have seen in the depths of winter the Union Court team out in the middle of Union Court with the balloons asking students to participate and participating online, and that's on top of a year and a half of asking students 
Um, one of the issues we've got right now is that student services is distributed over 11 sites on campus, and ironically, Student Central is actually not on campus. It's actually off campus, so it's not central. So we actually have a major problem in that students who are wishing to access services are having to wander all over the campus, and we've had a frustrating time getting PASA relocated back into Union Court after some delay, and the clubs and societies we're aware really don't have spaces to hang out to present their, their activities. So we've suggested having a clubs and societies house in uh, Union Court. We will, of course, accommodate the Kenyan, um, the Brian Kenyan room, Pasa and Anusa, absolutely. But all of those ancillary student services as well to make sure that students are not wandering here, there and everywhere to get the help and support that they need. Um, this is, it's critical that if you're building for your community, that your community knows where things are and they can access that support. So yes, students have been consulted, but we're consulting and we continue to. So if people feel very strongly about things, of course they get in touch with me. And I'm really proud to say the students have actually shown great levels of leadership in giving us feedback and letting us know what they would like to see. Starting with Kim on that film tonight, who, who you know, said, what would you keep, what would you, what would you get rid of? The students have been great. Thanks. We have a question here. Um, yes. Uh, my name is Chris Ronan. Um, I'm a community coordinator at Bruce Hall and an undergraduate student. Um, I have a question about the medium term of this project. Um, so, for example, the ANU um, prides itself on its student experience and how important that is. And during the process of this development, there's a potential that the whole life of, some, of a student's life on campus is going to be while it's being developed. Um, so I was just wondering what provisions are in there to make sure, ensure that its experience is still really, really good while this process is going on. Do you want me to? That's yeah. a great question. Yeah, it's I wouldn't mind answering a, that one. It's a very real question. <laughs> it's yeah. a really important question. I'm very conscious of that, that I could be asking a 15-year-old to deal with a building site. Um, so one of the key considerations here is to say, if we're going to do this, you can't allow this development to kind of bleed out over time. You can't have a situation where 15 year olds know only a construction site over an extended period of time. So keeping it focused in a shorter period is really important. Minimising the disruption and having places to, camp, to decant people is really important. But also I think that the kind of pop-up methodology has been really interesting for us saying if, if things are taken away, we do need to be able to provide services and we will do so um, through pop-up methodology. So one of the great things in this project for me has been working with Village Well, who are the progenitors of the laneways in Melbourne, about how it is we can keep spaces activated, understand what people want and make sure that students are not skirting around the edges of cha chain link fences for three years and staff the same thing too. So absolutely it's a critical part of the development of this. If it were to go ahead, would say that's absolutely on the money because I don't want a generation telling me that they were the ones that lived through the big hole in the ground and how miserable it was. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Oh, no, just to say that um, um, very, very intensive planning and energy has to go into that and uh, the pop-up village which Marnie talked about we see as a very particular piece of that work that we want to bring some really good minds to, including the Village Well guys, to really make it an experience. It's actually positive in its own right. Um, you, there's no getting away from the fact that it'll be sitting alongside some kind of construction site. But how short can we make that period and how alternative can that experience be in a positive way? Yeah, I mean, I can say from the perspective of the people in the university senior management that, um, that we want a project that's quick because we don't want the whole student life cycle for one cohort of students to be blighted by this. So we will ensure that anything yeah. that comes forward for approval really uh, achieves that. That's, that's critical. Did we have a question? <coughs> You've got a microphone? Great. G'day. Uh, Michael Blacksell, Physics and Engineering. Uh, one suggestion, first of all, before I ask my questions, and it was related to the sculptures that you were talking about on University Avenue. I was hoping that you'd also make them uh, more dynamic uh, sculptures because we've got really good engineers at this uh, university who could help make active things. We're talking about bringing public in. Uh, yes, some public like looking at static sculptures. Others look like, especially young kids, like looking at dynamic things, things that go boom, and I really like the idea about uh, integrating the music in with those sculptures also. So I'll get to my questions now. 
first thing is about the philosophy of the tower. It's probably the only thing in this whole thing that has really stuck out to me and gone, oh, I'm not really keen on that. <laughs> I was hoping that uh, maybe, maybe uh, light shows on the side of it to keep that dynamic um, influence going. And my second question, and I'm sorry I'm asking two, uh, Fellows Oval. Mm. Looks like it was a oval shape in the plan. I would like to know what your ideas about that is. Mm. And it also looked like in the meadows section, oh, you didn't talk about that uh, when you had the 2D image, looked like there was a couple of playing fields there. Um, could you expand on that? Mm. And if you're trying to bring a community in, because sporting is part of the uh, five point um, thing that we're talking about, have you ever considered bringing community in to a professional sporting organisation supported on the ANU campus like you see attempted to do with Brumbies? So, great set of questions. Yeah, what's You've the first one? by asking so many that <laughs> yeah. our attention span might not be well, long enough tower, to cope with them. Joe, that's <laughs> his. Joe, so, Joe, go the for the tower, the tower first. <laughs> Uh, I'd love to take on the question about the uh, ANU Tower uh, at the end of the boulevard, at the end, pardon me, Boulevard Avenue. I keep thinking of what uh, Griffin called it. Uh, when you look around the city, uh, this is a capital city, and one of the things that's really remarkable about its commemoration is seeing these important places in the city as really strong visual markers. The the, uh, at the end of the, the extension of, uh, of the avenue to terminate at this tower visually, we think is a, is a way to really mark this university as an important place in the capital city structure. It is a national university and it's a very important place in this city. And uh, it, it doesn't have, it, it could be one of those places that could, that could be very subtly uh, seen on the skyline of the city and could contribute to it without competing with anything. It's also an experience that, that people talk about how different, it, it's really amazing when you go around the hills around the campus and look down on the city. Uh, how beautiful that piece of landscape is with the, with the lake flowing through it and, and the markers that are around the edges of it and the park-like quality. To see that place from above is really something quite beautiful and a to place to get a new appreciation of the city that you live in and what the, what the parts, you can see them all coming together. So we thought the, the marker was a... Uh, a really good way to celebrate that and make it uh, commemorate that structure of monuments in, in, the, in the city that Griffin had in his mind. Uh, the second question I can was... Do the sport. I can... yeah. Why don't you go for the sport, Marnie? Uh, so every year we send out a questionnaire that goes with a student amenities fee and we talk about things that money is spent on and sport divides this community, <laughs> as you'd imagine. <laughs> um, the important thing about Canberra is that there is no notion with, of given feedback to the team, there is no notion of number one oval because there's no single sport that dominates the Canberra scene more than any other. So you've got Aussie rules, you've got soccer, you've got rugby. There's a whole range of sports. One of the things that we wanted to really reflect in the space was firstly, a lot of adverse student feedback about Fellows Oval. Um, it has a very unpleasant reputation in this university, so addressing that through good lighting, which we've already done, but to generate more activity in that space so yeah. that people are able to use it after hours and feel comfortable. So we've put yeah. change rooms in there, more amenity. You'll notice on the edge, we'd also put the basketball courts as well. And the last thing we want is basketball courts right next to where people are living. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to move it to give the space. There is the proposed swimming pool. I love it. On the edge. <laughs> and the, I've been one of the ones that they've been trying, I'm going, oh, I'm not sure about this. Um, mm -hmm. A gymnasium as well. Um, I'm conscious that there are all the, the sports, we, the large sports we talk about, but at the moment we have students who are playing badminton on the road <laughs> because there aren't enough badminton courts in the sports um, gymnasium. So there's a lot of growth in particular sports and we haven't perhaps kept pace with those activities. We've also, I think it's been very important to give the team feedback to make sure that sport's not just seen as a team sport 
uh, opportunity, but a great health and wellbeing opportunity. So the last thing, we did visit a space at RMIT, an outdoor sports space, and I very critically noticed that it was all guys playing sport outside, that I wanted to create outdoor yoga spaces and spaces where women could feel comfortable actually in engaging in exercise as well. As to whether we'd sponsor a team, look, it's a really important question. I think that the best answer would be to say, what would be the team that would represent the ethos of this university? And I suspect it probably wouldn't be a highly paid professional sporting team. Because a lot of people, the great thing about ANU sport is that the, the residential competitions, a lot of our teams, the soccer team for instance, they are members of the community who come in and play for fun, but they do really, really well. And I love the fact that it's a great place where the wider community connects with ANU in a really egalitarian way. And I suspect that if we were to engage in a conversation about sporting teams, people would instruct me to think about egalitarianism, community participation, and a broad range of ages participating. So if I were to have a sport team, at the moment we have three-year-olds training up in the gymnasium on the weekend, the soccer joeys. I'd love to see swim, swim schools here. I'd like to see community football, people playing, of all the codes out there. And the meadows, yes, we did size it up, but honestly, the sport that we had in my mind, I told them to think about was Quidditch, because we have a really <laughs> good Quidditch team. Um, and we, as a part of this project, I asked them to research the size of a Quidditch field for the international competition to make sure that we could produce a proper field. There you go. Don't you, don't you love universities? So many ideas. <laughs> and, and I think the meadow is, is intact. Yeah, it's oh. not been touched. It's not and it's the home yeah. of Quidditch and it will stay yeah. there. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what appealed to, to us also was the thought that if, if some of the, those sporting events that now happen in the North Oval and driving by there last week and seeing what was going on there and the, and, and the activity, that if you can imagine that happening right at the front door of Chifley and how those events, those sporting events could really help to activate Union Court mm. before and after events, they're, they're, gonna, they're really going to help to energize and activate those restaurants and cafes and the pub and all that lane activity. It, I mean, it's a great place to think of sport connections yeah. with, the, with, the, uh, with the court and with the avenue. It's, uh, I'm really gl glad you brought that up. It's really uh, one, of the, one of the great initiatives of this plan yeah, is yeah. to make that more important for sports. Okay, we'll move to the next question. Is there a microphone just in the front? Here we go. Hi, my name's Stephanie. I'm an undergraduate student. Um, just in relation to your answer to Michael's question, um, you didn't actually say that you, uh, whether or not you had actually conversed with the community spaces on campus and, and the groups who run them. And I, I think that it's definitely necessary to, g given their hi high levels of interaction with uh, much of the uh, community on campus. Yep, um, so I'm happy to say that yes we have, there's over 200 societies, there are the collectives as well as part of ANUSA, yes there's been very active engagement, some have um, been more responsive than others I have to say, mm. but also the learning communities, um, we want to bring them into Union Court as well and give them a home, so yes we have. It hasn't been the case that it always people have answered our request to get in touch because they have other things going on in their lives, but we certainly have reached out across the broad collectives, mm. across the clubs and societies, uh, both at undergraduate and graduate level, to make sure that we understand the range of activity that's going on and we build spaces that are appropriate for activity. We've also included, of course, Griffin Hall in there because Griffin's got its little, little outpost there. We want to make sure that, that the virtual hall uh, is reflected appropriately in the space. So, yes, we have. We have one down here. <coughs> Hi, how are you going? Um, my name's Jodie. I manage the co-op bookshop on campus. Um, my question is, um, from a retailer point of view, what's the plan for the current retailers on campus? Yeah. Well, there's a long way to go yet in terms of um, evolving the precise um, configurations and who's who. Um, our intention will be to preserve as much of those as we can. Um, but. In saying that, we're looking for a contemporising of the types of food and services that are offered. Um, it can't go on the way it is in, in fundamental terms. And so um, we, we'll, we'll be working with the university to come up with what we'd call a retail plan or a food and, food and beverages and services plan that actually uh, um, gives the university community the best that it, the, the, that it expects. And uh, uh, you know, that's, there's some, some hard work to do on that yet. 
Thanks. Just here. Hi, um, my name's Tom and I'm an undergraduate student. Um, so my question kind of related to, I suppose, engaging with non-residential students. So you've outlined um, some great plans to build um, residences for staff and students, but given more than 50% of um, undergraduates live off campus, um, and I suppose the learning spaces have, I guess, been rejigged what are your plans to engage non-residential students? Mm. Um, and I suppose, could you elaborate on the new teaching um, and learning spaces? Well, an another member of our team, uh, Sam Shepard, is really passionate about how those non-residential uh, students, how their day goes, and the sense of belonging that they might have on, and the sense of home and a, and a place that they can call their own. So we are working as part of that whole student life um, suite of experiences and offers to see how we can actually devise uh, effectively such a place. Um, so that's early, it's early days when it comes to that, but uh, definitely uh, he's not letting us off the hook in terms of how that experience might work, given the proportions, yeah. Irrespective of the development, Richard's got as part of his student experience plan really focusing in on um, making sure that the best experiences are available to both groups of students. Um, so I'm aware of the differences there. One of the proposals we've got in the new education plan is that we really harness the energy of the co-curriculum far more on the campus. We, we focus a lot on the formal curriculum, the degrees, the courses, but there's an awful lot more we could be doing in the non-formally accredited spaces, clubs, societies, leadership, opportunities to participate, whether you live on campus or you don't. It's a very lively and organic place, it's wonderful, and I think that actually what we should be doing is shaping that a little bit more so that everybody gets the chance to participate, whether they live on campus or they don't, okay? And so it's a big, a big consideration. In terms of the learning spaces, uh, this year's been a great year of learning for us. We've put those thermal sensors into the <laughs> lecture theatres to track how people are using our spaces. Um, it's no surprise that the tutorials and the seminar rooms are used by the students, but the lecture theatres increasingly are not but we have great demand for lecture theatres for public events. So that's interesting that it's spaces like this that are probably more useful for public events than they are for teaching. There's no tablets in here anyway. The, as far as we can see, the feedback on the learning spaces is flat floor spaces, simple things like wheels on the tables so people can move the furniture around, <laughs> lots of PowerPoints, wireless. Uh, right, yes, that would be a dream, wouldn't it? We've got <laughs> really... <laughs> And we've surveyed both staff and students about that to ask them, what does your dream classroom have in it? What should it have? Um, my feeling is a lot of the feedback is flat floor, get the basics right. Get the wireless working. Get it with natural airflow. Please don't you know, climate control it so that we don't feel like we're actually in connection with outside. Lots of feedback saying, can we have windows so people can see the energy and the activity and the learning and teaching in the university? We don't want to hide away the good stuff. So there's a couple of classrooms on campus that are already of that ilk, but there's not enough of them. And so just as we're going to focus the retail, we're going to try and focus more of the learning and teaching into this space as well, mm. so that even if you're not living in a college, we want you to feel like you're absolutely part of the energy and the activity on this campus, and that you're going to get recognised whether you're doing something as part of an, a degree or part of just a, a club of society. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the time has come. We've got one more hand that's just gone up, so we'll take that question, but that'll be our last one. My name's Andrew Schuler. It's a very simple question. How's this massive and rather exciting project going to be funded? <laughs> <laughs> the inevitable. So, um, Andrew, it's a great question. So it is a proposal. It is going to council. <coughs> so what we've tried to do is we've identified uh, parts of the development that we think that could be externally funded because what we don't want to do, um, and, and I don't want this to sound horrible, we don't, what we don't want to do is to divert the university's resources away from building a lot of our new faculty buildings. So we've agreed to build a new research school of social sciences, computer science, mathematics. We need to engage in the rejuvenation of, of our research and academic spaces. They've, and they need a lot of work. So wherever we're able to, we will be looking to see if we can get external investment, but university controlled spaces. But big ticket items like the library, this is a responsibility that falls to us and we have to explore how to do this. It's a core part of the development and that's obviously something that we'll be working through. 
But what we're going to try and do is to make sure that we can do this but not um, slow down or jeopardise the program that we've now got going of building new academic buildings to make sure that the, the rest of the campus doesn't lag behind and we don't have good facilities. Thank you, Marnie. I think we've come to the end of our allotted time, so thank you for being a great audience. You've really asked a lot of great questions, and the feedback that we're hearing through the questions will continue to be absorbed. Really wonderful input. Christine hasn't had the chance to answer any questions about parking, parking. so Christine is delighted. Oh, no. So thanks, Andrew. Was, was there just, anything you wanted to say? I was just going to thank you all for not raising the question of parking. Um, transport, yes, but not parking. Um, I've only been at the university for just over two years, and I see this as probably, well, I see it as the most transformational project that the university has and probably will undertake since nearly 70 years ago when the dream was first dreamt. One of the things that, um, that I, I find really exciting about this is, is what I call creating the heritage of the future. A lot of people have talked about demolishing buildings and, and, and what are we going to do with the artwork and what, would, what are we going to do with this and that and all those things. This is about um, understanding and capturing the social heritage of the university and the Union Court area, but it, I see it as really a, a huge opportunity for us to create the heritage of the future. So I think it's a, a fantastic step forward. Thanks, Christine. And, and for me, you know, I was excited when I first heard of this project. Tonight makes me more excited. I think the creativity that's being brought by our colleagues mm -hmm. is, is exceptional, and it's, um, it's a journey that I think we all look forward to. So thank you for your participation this evening, and we look forward to continuing to talk to you. Your feedback ongoing is, is very welcome. So we'll draw proceedings to a close formally now, but I'm sure the conversations will continue and encourage you to do that. So thank you for being a great audience. Good night.